<laughs> well, listen, I just recorded the audio book a few months ago for, uh, uh, you know, for my new book, which meant, and I had to do it remotely. So I was it, literally in a closet wow. uh, with blankets on the wall and clothes all around me and uh, yeah. the computer in another room. And oh my gosh, it was hilarious. Nice. And, and I had a uh, producer in New York and an engineer in Boston. <laughs> <So> <laughs> crazy. High tech. This is not nearly so high tech. And you're a music guy too, right? I'm judging based on the guitars on the wall behind yeah, you. Yeah, I am. I am. Like I love the to play. In the book, yeah. Yeah. Nice. I'm admiring some of those actually. Yeah, the uh, the big one is a, uh, a baritone. Nice. Yeah. Fun. Um, uh, I didn't, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Elliot. I'm, I'm just the, the buttons guy. <laughs> That's great, Elliot. You're the, you're the, without you, the, we, we don't do anything. So exactly. He's not, it's definitely not just the buttons guy. <laughs> just a fun conversation without Elliot. Right. Brian, we usually go for an hour, hour and a half. How, how much time do you have with that? Yeah, that's great. Let's plan on, let's, you know, we'll see where we are in an hour. And I always think it's best to leave people wishing for more, but if we're going <laughs> strong, that's great. Perfect. Um, any other questions before we get rolling? Uh, no, you, I, I'm assuming you guys try to do a live take without editing, or do you also edit? We, no, we, we definitely edit. edit. So if you have to cough or something, no big deal. But okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah this will probably be out in about three weeks, I think. So Great. Um, should we get things rolling? Yeah, I think we're ready. All right. Well, Brian McLaren, thank you so much for being with us, and welcome to the podcast. Well, I've got to say, this is one of the best names of a podcast of any I've been on. So uh, happy to be with you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's such a gift to have you. Um, Brian, for the four listeners that we have that don't know who you are, <laughs> fill in a little bit about your story. Sure. Well, uh, I, I grew up in upstate New York, lived most of my life in Maryland. I've lived in Florida the last 12 years. I started my career as a college English teacher. And so I've, uh, in fact, I had kind of a minor in philosophy. I loved mm -hmm. philosophy. And um, I ended up becoming a pastor, helped start a church, uh, co-led that church for 24 years. And then uh, during that time, I started writing books. And for the last, I don't know how many years, gosh, 14, 15 years, I've uh, worked as a writer and speaker. And then I've got a bunch of causes that I uh, can be involved with too. One of the fun things that um, most people know is you're, I mean, I was going to do a Facebook post to say today to say, I'm going to give you a guess of is the, this guy that we're having on as an interview tonight is probably one of the top two biggest lightning rods in the Christian movement in the last 15 years. And I'll bet everybody would have been able to guess it was either you or Rob Bell. Um, <laughs> I want to know how that feels to be that lightning rod. And I mean, your, your book that we're going to talk about today, Faith After Doubt, is so gracious and generous and just beautiful. And there's so there's no vindictiveness in you. There's no bitterness in, in there. It really is a beautiful thing. How did you get to that place, Brian? <laughs> well, you, you, I don't know to how, if I'm, if I'm uh, fooling everybody to think I don't have my bad days, but um, I'll, I'll tell you uh, two things uh, that, that helped me. Uh, one was, uh, one of my mentors, uh, when I, I don't know, my second or third book had come out and he pulled me aside and handed me this prayer that was written down on, you know, I don't know if you remember old fashioned ditto paper, but anyhow, it was a well, really old piece of paper. And it was uh, a prayer by a Serbian Orthodox bishop uh, called a prayer for my enemies. If anybody's interested, if you go to my website, which is brianmclaren.net and you just put in prayer for enemies in the search, it'll come right up. It's just this beautiful prayer. And he handed it to me and he said, I have a feeling you're going to need this. <laughs> and uh, for many years, it sat on my desk and I would read it and reread it to the point where it, I've almost memorized it. But uh, anyhow, that was a huge help to me because it really, uh, it, it just took me to a place I certainly wasn't going on my own. I, I, I uh, you know, it, it would be much easier now if I were getting the criticism that I was getting when I was in my 30s and early 40s. Uh, you know, it's just, I wasn't at a place, I think, where I, I was able to handle it. So that prayer helped me a whole lot. But then the other thing that helped me is I would always get these uh, sort of backhanded compliments. Um, uh, like, 
uh, one time an editor, and I might as well just say it, he was an edit editor of Christianity Today, which is a magazine a lot of people would know. Um, mm -hmm. he, he pulled me aside and he said, uh, uh, we, we met in a hallway at some conference and he said, oh, McLaren, yeah, read a couple of your books. I really don't agree with them. Really, really don't <laughs> approve of what you're doing. Really don't like it. And he said, but I got to say, my kids are far away from the Christian faith. And if they ever come back, it won't be to my kind of Christianity. It'll be to yours. And so there were things like that, you know, that you would just realize, yeah, people are doing the best they can. And so I'll try to do the best I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're going to be talking about Brian's book that um, I, I don't know when you released it, Brian. Was that late 2020? Uh, it came out in January. Uh, okay, 2021. January. Yeah. It's called Faith After Doubt. And I must say it is a beautiful book. I mean, it's just really incredible. Struck me as just, there's been a couple of important books I would put under that important category recently that have come out. And this is one of them. It's it's given, it gave me as a pastor so much understanding to the people that I pastor who struggle with doubt and have walked through faith crises. And there's so many people in the church right now who have either left the church or feel like they're on the cusp of it because they can't swallow what they've been told they've been told they have to swallow with it when it comes to beliefs and faith and all of that. And this book is a must read for anyone who's walking with somebody in faith crisis or struggles with doubt themselves, which is so many of us. So I just want to jump right in, Brian. Um, you t you speak to this phenomenon of clergy struggling with doubt in pastors mm -hmm. in the pulpit even um, struggling with doubt struggling with faith crises struggling with the, having questions and being in this this land that you call perplexity even yeah. and they're not able they don't feel freedom to to share that with their congregation because they know that if they did they get fired and they have to pay off this debt that they just that they just accrued in seminary and so they're between this rock and a hard place where they can't be their genuine genuine <coughs> <laughs> all right should i start over again or where they can't okay be their genuine. where they can't be their genuine selves and that sounds like a slow death to me oh, yeah. and i i i uh empathize so much with joel the the woman who you highlight in chapter six so much can you speak to this reality where there sure. are church leaders pastors who feel like they can't be themselves who feel like they can't bring the truest part of who they are and what they believe and what they're living out and then these gatekeepers who make it so it's almost impossible for them to come out as having doubt or struggling with their faith yeah it, it's funny uh, you bring that up uh, just i think it was yesterday or the day before i got an email from a denominational leader who just read the book. And he said to me, uh, boy, it was such a, a powerful paragraph. He, in this email, he says, uh, so many of the pastors under my care are going through faith crises right now. Many of them are, are feeling that they don't want to spend the rest of their lives working in churches, especially white evangelical churches, he said. Mm -hmm. um, and then, he, and then you know, that, that was very moving. And then he said, and the same is true of me. Mm. So what a lot of people don't realize is that there are a whole lot of clergy who look at what the, the word Christian means in America today. Uh, and, and there's an evangelical version of this. There's a Catholic version because I'm hearing from Catholic priests and you know, a lot of Catholic leaders as well uh, who are having similar struggles. And they just feel something's gone terribly wrong uh, and so they're, and, and they, they have ideas and they've read books and they have dreams about change. But if they were to say them to their congregation, there'd probably be 25% who'd be so happy and relieved and thrilled. And, and there'd be another 25% who would be ready to fire them and, uh, and all the rest, you know? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, it's really tough. My, uh, if I were to say the typical clergy biography that based on my experience in the United States, so many of the people who become pastors become pastors, not because they love church, but because they love the youth group or they love the summer camp or they love the mission trip. Um, and youth group, summer camp, mission trip are what were spiritually for formative for them. And they decided to go to seminary. And, and many of them had a faith crisis in seminary because very often in seminary, you're exposed to scholarship that folks don't hear in the pew. 
and suddenly they have to grapple with new levels of complexity. And, um, but by the time they finish seminary, most, uh, I'll just tell you, most younger people I meet ha have nothing but good to say about their seminary experience. <laughs> Maybe the debt is a problem, but in terms of the chance to just have deep and open and open-minded and open-hearted and far-ranging uh, conversations about the Bible and theology and faith, you know, people love that when they have that chance. And then they come back, they get assigned to their first church and they find out that a whole lot of the people might listen to them one hour on every, uh, every Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, they're listening to Fox News or until recently they were listening to Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson or whoever it is. And these people are having such a formative influence on them that if the pastor says anything out of line with these, uh, in some ways, you might call them the covert clergy <laughs> of their yeah. lives. Uh, you know, the, the pastor is in trouble. Mm -hmm. Brian, I, uh, I just this afternoon read a, a short story or novella that I wonder if you've read. It was by um, Miguel de Unamuno, who is cited in one of your epigraphs in the book. And randomly, total coincidence, a friend of mine who is an atheistic philosopher had recommended a short story of his to me, and I just got around to reading it today. Uh, and it's called St. Manuel, the Good Martyr. I don't know if you've I know, I have not read, read this that. story. What? Oh, I just read one of his novels, one of Unamuno's uh, novels a year or two ago. Now, what's the name of it? Anyway, go ahead. I haven't read that. that maybe uh, maybe there's story. a theme that runs through his work. I don't know. This is all I've read by. But it's about a, a saintly priest in a small village in Spain who is a legit saint by all accounts yes, and, and, yeah. and devotes his life to the poor and serving the people in his village and refuses a call to a successful career. Uh, but you find out spoiler <laughs> yes. that, that he's been deep in doubt and probably just straightforward atheism his yes. whole life. But uh, he's a martyr in the sense of the title because he conceals his doubt from the people that he serves and presents to them a picture of what you would call simplicity. Mm that gives them joy because at the end of the day, he doesn't think anything else other than their happiness matters anyway. Mm. Uh, and so the fact that death is the end of existence, if he told them they wouldn't understand it, it wouldn't matter and they wouldn't believe yes. him anyway. So, yes. so he, he serves them with a false confidence and that's yes. the sense in which he's a martyr. And I literally just read that this afternoon, right after finishing your book. And it was just <laughs> such a weird juxtaposition that I had to yes. mention it to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, you're bringing to my knowing that you like fiction. There are just so many really powerful stories like this. You know, you think, I don't know if you, you like science fiction, but the Sparrow, which is a science fiction with a theological twist uh, has a similar kind of theme. A guy goes to be a missionary to another planet and, uh, and has, and it, I won't go into the details, but you know, he comes back a broken man and, uh, oh my goodness, so much great literature, Poisonwood Bible, uh, mm. incredible. Uh, yeah, so much literature dealing with this issue of, of the secret dimensions of doubt. Of course, you don't have to go to fiction. You think of Mother Teresa yeah. when some of her journals were, were, uh, were published and you find that and, and, you know, I, I don't know what to make of the, the, the story from Unamuno there, but you think of Mother, Mother Teresa and you think, uh, it, it doesn't make me think less of her. It makes me see even something more beautiful in her that she continued yeah. to love and serve. And it wasn't because she had this, you know, overflowing faith. It was, it was uh, or let's say it this way, she didn't have overflowing feelings of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, we're, we've already used a couple of terms that, that are key and central in this book, Faith After Doubt. Um, you present these stages of faith yes. and doubt as the portal. Could you just, for our listeners who haven't read your book, Brian, can you just walk us through those four sure. stages? Sure. And I always like to say, anybody who hears about a stage theory and feels suspicious, I share your suspicion. And stage I appreciated that so much in the book. <laughs> oh, my God. I just stage have to say. <laughs> yeah, stage theories can be abused terribly. But on the other hand, they're super helpful. The, the analogy I always think of is when uh, many, many years ago when my wife and I had our first child uh, and you know we met with this 
uh, nurse and she talked to, to us about the first trimester of pregnancy and the second trimester and the third trimester and what to expect. And then when it came close to delivery, we went to childbirth classes and they talked about the different stages. And it sure helps when you're going through something for the first time uh, to have somebody tell you, here's what to expect. So that to me is what's helpful about stages. But what I did is I took, I, I just became fascinated with this 30 or 40 years ago and started reading stage theory. And over the years, I've accumulated probably a dozen different theorists who I, I've been especially interested in. Um, and I try to synthesize them, integrating with my own experience as a person of faith and then as a pastor. So four simple stages, easy to remember. Simplicity is the stage of dualism. Everything is a simple us, them, friend, enemy, good, evil, uh, safe, dangerous, um, and a lot of people, that's the faith that they have uh, for their whole lives. And they, in fact, a lot of people, including clergy, think that's what religion is for, mm. to keep everybody simple in terms of their morality and their theology. But a lot of people uh, through travel or reading or education or suffering get plunged out of simplicity and uh, the easy answers don't work anymore. And they find themselves in complexity. And I call that the stage of pragmatism because when those easy answers don't work, you try to make your life work and you try to figure out your own ways of coping with a complex world that doesn't fit in those simple categories you were raised with as a child. And a lot of people stay in complexity their whole lives. I think the mega, the, the mega church phenomenon in many ways is, is complexity. It's, it's a sort of self-helpy usually, you know, and uh, not so dogmatic, but very uh, inspirational and uplifting. Um, and then uh, a lot of people that works and then other people for one reason or another that falls apart. And my contention is that um, when you, in each of these stages, when you begin to not just doubt specific elements of the stage, but you doubt the way that stage works, that's what thrusts you into a new stage. And the third stage would be perplexity. And that's when everything is in doubt and where in some ways you reverse everything from your first two stages. <clears throat> you become suspicious of those authority figures who told you all the easy answers. And, um, and in fact, you become maybe even cynical and skeptical about uh, what you've been taught because you just see that, it's, that life isn't that simple and that often those people who told you they were moral were actually doing immoral things and, and harming people. So perplexity is super important. And a lot of folks hit it in graduate school and a lot of folks hit it in midlife and a lot of folks don't hit it till later in life um, and a lot of folks never hit it but and many stay there and then the fourth stage that I think and one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I, I, I have a special place in my heart for people in stage three they think that's all there is and I want to help them see actually I think there's something even beyond stage three and I call that harmony so simplicity complexity perplexity and harmony is where we try to integrate the strengths from the earlier stages, but also become honest about the weaknesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, in chapter eight, you speak of this reality that you had and that I've seen so many of my friends who've walked through faith crisis or mm -hmm. been crippled by doubt. And that is that they were hoping to find this silver bullet that just yeah. comes out of nowhere saying, God, if you're real, you're going to have to speak to me. You're going to have to do something crazy, yeah. supernatural. And I come from even a little bit of a charismatic background, yeah. which lends itself to that, to saying, well, if God's real, he's going to show up. And yeah. that I, I don't, I've never been a fan of that. Yes. And you speak to that reality. Can you, can you just speak to that, what that feels like? And then what's sure. a better way maybe? What's so interesting, you, for you being from a charismatic background, I was from a very non-charismatic background and then I got the full treatment and I, you know, but there was this period of time where everybody was telling me I needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. And um, I kept praying to speak in tongues and I, it just didn't happen for the longest time. And, and I remember thinking if I could just experience that, I would know forever that God is real and the Holy Spirit is real and that the Bible is true. And, and for other people, it's if this miracle would happen, if this healing would happen. And, um, and you know what, sometimes they happen. Uh, but here's the thing, life goes on <laughs> and the, the next miracle might not happen. And for me, I remember when I finally had some of these spiritual experiences I was told that I should have, uh, I remember thinking, but 
this could all be psychological. In other words, those things that were supposed to prove something, I found they mm -hmm. didn't necessarily prove anything. And, um, uh, and so uh, what I'd recommend for people is, I, I understand how, how appealing it is to have a kind of Hail Mary pass mm -hmm. uh, of some one silver bullet that's gonna solve all of your problems. And if you want to try that, obviously be my guest, but I have a feeling that after the second time or the third time or the fourth time that that disappoints you, you're going to have to say, you know what, maybe the answer to this isn't a shortcut, maybe. And in fact, maybe this isn't a problem I'm supposed to solve. Maybe this is one of the experiences of life that is actually supposed to deepen and expand my faith. Totally. Oh, yeah. Sheesh, we could be done right there. <laughs> but we're not going to be. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> Kyle. You don't want to ask your, your chapter 10 question? Oh, that's right. Sorry. We've got our outline here, and I try to honor where Kyle wants to jump in. But um, in chapter 10, Brian, you speak of the great need for forward-leaning, and I'm quoting you here, forward-leaning faith communities that nourish the values and narratives of a new kind of faith, faith after and with doubt, as you say so many times. Can you just put put some, put some a picture in and flesh that out a little bit? What does that what do those faith communities potentially look like that you dream of that you see as desperately needed right now? Yes. Well, you know, there's a sentence that I don't think I ever wrote in the book. Uh, I, I wish I could go back and stick it in. Uh, and it would be this, that doubt is not the enemy of faith. Doubt is the enemy of authoritarianism. Mm. And I think part of what's going on in the world, and one of the reasons we have such crazy stuff going on in the Christian world, and not just the Christian world, there's bad stuff happening in Judaism and bad stuff happening in Islam and bad stuff happening in Buddhism. Uh, and, uh, and there's pretty bad stuff happening in atheism too. In other words, we're, we've got a, an authoritarianism problem that is sprouting up all over. I think I've written some about this if people are interested. I have a little ebook that I've written called The Second Pandemic that's about authoritarianism. But, um, but one of our problems is that our religion has been an authoritarian religion. Uh, and uh, obviously there are many wonderful leaders who are not authoritarian, but it's just sort of in the, it's in the water, you know, it's in the, it's in the bloodstream of, of our religion. And um, so when I think of a stage four faith community, the first thing I think about is a community that doesn't run on authoritarianism. It doesn't mean there's no authority and it doesn't mean there's no leadership, but it means it's the kind of leadership that Jesus tried to model when he, um, for example, when he said, I no longer call you servants, but friends. To mm -hmm. me, that was Jesus saying, uh, you know, I don't want an authoritarian relationship with you guys. That's not what I want. Uh, I want you to do greater things than I've done. He even dares to say that. So there's a different kind of leadership. And and part of the, the, one of the tools of authoritarianism is that we make people uh, say that they agree with certain statements, whether they even understand them or whether they agree with them. And it's a way for, for and, and the reason many authority figures do this is because their authority figures did it to them. And we could go back generation after generation. It becomes kind of a, a cultural habit. It's very interesting. You, you don't find Jesus doing that sort of thing. He, he comes up to people and says, follow me. And they don't have to, they can walk away, but he invites them to follow. And if they follow, he leads them on an adventure and he tells them stories and, and he, learn, he, he helps them learn how to live, which is different than just telling them what to believe. And, um, and he models it. He doesn't just uh, give it as, he doesn't write any books, you know, mm -hmm. thank God. He, he lived a life and, and modeled that life. And, and that to me is what a stage four faith community would be about. It would, it would say, uh, we're trying to be a community that is seeking to learn a way of life. And, and as a Christian faith community, we're inspired by Jesus. And, um, and that is the kind of life uh, we're seeking to live. And, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing is, uh, I mean, this is happening. It, it's always been happening. But, um, but we're in a bad patch right now where... Uh, a whole lot of authoritarian Christian leaders have gained a whole lot of power. And, uh, and that's why I think we're, we're at this period. It's causing a lot of people to doubt 
uh, they don't want that kind of, they don't, it just doesn't smell like Jesus. And so they want something different. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, my follow-up question or not follow-up question, but um, we highlighted questions because we had too many in our outline, outline uh -huh. and I forgot to highlight my last one. So here's my last one, Kyle. <laughs> um, I'm a parent, Brian. I have four yeah. kids. My oldest is 13, about to be 14. And for the last 14 years, my wife and I have been talking about and trying to figure out how do we raise our kids in a way that gives them a faith foundation while giving them a foundation of faith that they don't have to deconstruct when they hit 17 or 19 or whatever, you know, how do yes. we, how do we give them containers to hold faith in a healthy and spacious way? And you have a ch chapter, chapter 13, that's all about creating spiritualities of harmony for the rising generation, which I think is just, if you're a parent, this book is worth just chapter 13 to go out and get it because it's so beautiful. Um, and I was reminded last Sunday, I'm driving with my whole family to my in-laws and my kids start talking about demons and angels. And my son, who's 12, said, what's a demon? I said, well, you know, there's angels like that visited Mary and Joseph and they're beings, spiritual beings that assist God. And then there's, the Bible says there's demons and they assist, you know, the enemy and Satan. And I could see their eyes crossing a little bit. And I said, well, basically, we're not sure if they're real actual beings or if they're just metaphors and pictures for something that that is just evil in the world. And my almost 14 year old daughter sat there for a second. No one else said anything. She said, I kind of think it's that metaphor one. I kind of think it's a picture for, for the evil that happens in the world. And it's just an easy way for us to understand it. And I sat there in wonder yes. of thinking like my 13 year old has a grid for metaphor and myth in the Bible in ways that maybe she might not have to deconstruct right away. And it was just so thankful to God in that moment. You, you create this spacious place for parents to give some tips for parents to raise their kids in a healthier form of spirituality. Can you just go through, give us an outline maybe? Sure. sure. Well, first, what a beautiful story. And I, and, and I'm so happy for your daughter. I'm so happy that she has a father and a pastor and a church where that sort of thing can be said. And what's so beautiful is you, you were bringing her out of stage one into stage two because you didn't tell her what the right answer was. In fact, you gave her two good options. Mm. That's something a stage one leader can never do. They can only give you a right option and a wrong option, mm -hmm. but you gave her good options, permissible, acceptable options. And then you invited her to think about it for herself. So just, that's so, that's so beautiful. But the, the first thing I'd say is, um, you know, there's a, a whole group of books and authors that were really big when I was young uh, raising children. And the first thing I'd say is please don't read any of those books. Um, <laughs> because what they really were doing was teaching authoritarian parenting. Yeah. And it was pure, they were, they were raising children to, to be stage one um, their whole lives. And, and, and so much harm has been done. So what I'd recommend is get some new books. And, and I'll tell you, there's a book I'd highly recommend. It's by a couple named Jeffrey and Amy Ulrich. Uh, they'd be great people to have on your podcast. Mm. Uh, they wrote a book called The Six Needs of Every Child. And Jeffrey's a brilliant psychologist. And um, uh, it's just a wonderful book. And, and so the first thing I'd say is be sure you don't, you don't let yourself be inducted into a kind of parenting that won't be helpful. Mm. And, and I'm sad to say that a lot of religious books will, you know, I don't think will take you in a good direction. But um, the, the big thing, here's what I'd say is if, if, if this idea of stages makes sense, and the way I see it, I don't see it like, you know, you're going from the 10 to 20 yard line is stage one and the 20 to 40 yard line is stage two. I see it more like rings on a tree. Stage one is like the center ring on a tree. And then another bigger ring grows and builds on those capacities. And then another ring builds on those capacities. And then I think stage four, uh, becomes the new simplicity. And then we sort of keep repeating that process. But um, uh, what that means is that when you're teaching your eight-year-old, you don't want to say anything to your eight-year-old that you'll have to unteach your eight-year-old when she's 16. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to teach your 16-year-old anything that you'd have to unteach her when she's 32. Um, and so you always at work at the early stages with the later stages in mind. And and um, and that I, I think uh, I think that will it, it it will help you be honest. And then the only, maybe the one other thing I'd say, there's a great 
a theologian of Christian education named John Westerhoff. He wrote a book back in the 1970s called Will Our Children Have Faith? And John made a startling diagnosis. He felt that, that people were losing their faith because of Sunday school. Now, mm -hmm. and what he meant by this was when you put all first graders together and you teach them in, in age appropriate ways and then you put all second graders together and so on. The one thing that children never have is the chance to hear older children and adults talk a lot about their own faith, honestly. And he's, he believed that storytelling is at the core of the building of a healthy faith, honest storytelling. And so you imagine, I can imagine your 13 year old uh, daughter in 20 years saying, I remember a ride in the car with my dad where he said, some people think it's this way, some people think it's that way. And it was the first time I felt I had permission to think for myself, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and you, you hear someone say, yeah, you know, uh, I, uh, you, you, you know, imagine hearing a person who's, you know, my age or older, and they say, yeah, I, I, my faith was going fine, and then my spouse died. Mm -hmm. And for a few years, I didn't even believe there was a God anymore. Um, and, and for a, a kid to hear that, they think, oh, these sort of things happen. That's, that's, not, that's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something you have to pretend about. That's, to me, that creates an environment of safety. Mm -hmm. So good. So switching gears a little bit here. Um, so when I think of the kind of authoritarianism you were talking about earlier, we've had lots of previous episodes about our, our feelings about American Christianity and evangelicalism and whatnot. So our listeners know what we think about that. But uh, on my journey through your stages, if I can flatter myself that, I've, <laughs> that I'm at least approaching stage four, one thing I've been very tempted to from time to time is to just give up on the whole yeah. thing and try to form some kind of secularized alternative community something like the Mennonites, but without all the hokiness <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and just abandon the church structure altogether and kind of try to start from scratch. And I think there's a lot of people in my generation that are, that would be gung ho about something like that. But it seems like in your book, you think that's a bad idea. And you seem to at one point uh, suggest that stage four faith ought not to do that. And, and one of the reasons you give is just so practical and I want to hear your thoughts on it. <laughs> and it is, if we did that, we'd be giving up all the real estate that the church has gained. And I think you mean that metaphorically and literally. <laughs> yeah. So can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Well, first, I don't think I'd say that I think it's a bad idea. I, 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 I'd say um, that, uh, that, we, that we need people to do a lot of different things. And I frankly think there are some people in some places who do need to leave because they're because the place where they are is doing them damage and it's doing their children damage and, and it's just not healthy to stay. Um, uh, I don't wanna violate anybody's private, privacy, but I was just on a call the other night with 60 members of a, a religious community that is highly, highly authoritarian. And they were telling me that if they were to question, if, if they're spiritual leaders were to find out they were reading this book and all 60 of them or 55 or whatever it was were reading the book if their leaders found out they were reading this book they would be kicked out of their church mm. and their children they go to church-based school their children would be kicked out of the school um th they might have to leave town to find a job because they'd be blackballed so mm. you just you know so I, I don't, would never say to anybody that I would never say that everybody needs to do the same thing, because I think, you know, there are really toxic religious communities out there that people should just, you know, get as far away from as fast as they can. Um, but, you know, the other thing that came to mind, Kyle, when you said that, like, you know, maybe just create like a secular community that focuses on what really matters. I could imagine people saying that's what Jesus was doing. And I could very much imagine people say that's what Paul was doing. Um, I, as you know, I quote uh, Paul quite a bit in this last part of the book. Uh, and when Paul says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything at all. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. I can just imagine a whole lot of people saying he is a liberal, he is a heretic because the Bible says that circumcision matters. 
And he's saying it doesn't really matter. And so you think if you put aside something like that, you can just see how people would have said, yeah, they've just given up. They're going creating another environment where, you know, tax collectors and prostitutes are welcome to the table. You know, what kind of a table is that? So I, I would say actually that doing the kind of thing you just described, I would consider that's part of the work. Uh, but the, to get to your actual question, um, I do think that there are parts of the Christian faith community uh, and parts of the Christian tradition that are certainly redeemable and salvageable. And um, we shouldn't give up quite yet <laughs> on, on everything. Uh, so I, I hope that does that feel free to uh, push back if that doesn't answer your question. Well, it seemed like you were also hinting that and maybe I'm reading into this, because I don't know, maybe, maybe this is my own subversive misreading, reading that into your book, but it seemed like maybe you were gesturing towards somehow using the structures that have been yeah. built for other purposes. Well, look, let's face it. Um, most of our Christian denominations in America that have been around for over 150 years were built on slavery. I mean, the wealth that built those churches came from people who either had slaves in the South or were running, you know, cotton manufacturing businesses in the North that was using the slave labor of the South to pick the cotton. So um, everything in our faith is deeply, deeply uh, polluted. I mean, there's no purity. We're, we're, we're way beyond innocence. Mm -hmm. um, almost all of our churches are on, maybe all of them are on stolen land. So, um, you know, we, we have th that reality to face. But uh, in the spirit of being subversive, um, Kyle, I would say two things. First, if we give up all of the tradition um, and to the most regressive and reactionary and hateful and fearful people, uh, that puts an awful lot of power in their hands. And I'm not sure that's a good idea just practically. Um, to just, you know, walk away that easily. But second, there really are treasures. And, and the fact is everything, including myself, is, is tainted and, and polluted and corrupted. So we're always talking about redeeming corrupted, corrupted things, you know, uh, making, yeah. uh, as Michael Gunger's old song uh, said, making beautiful things out of, yeah. sometimes out of pretty trashy things. <laughs> So next question is kind of heavy. You ready for it? Okay. Uh, so do you have any genuine hope that you could say the church, but I really want to ask about humanity in general, yeah. actually will transcend to what you call a stage four? Yeah. Uh, and if so, what do you think the most likely path is? And the answer cannot be doubt. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, look, uh, some days I'm more optimistic than others. Um, but I'll tell you my three biggest, uh, the three things that make me least hopeful. Um, first is the climate. I mean, we have made trillions of dollars by exploiting the climate. And there are trillions more dollars to be made by sucking fossil fuels out and pumping them into the atmosphere. And the power, the love of money, it seems to me, is really running the world. And, uh, and, and of course, money is a form of power. So it's the love of money and the love of power together. And I'm just not sure we're going, I mean, already it's too late to avoid catastrophic uh, effects of climate change. I, at least all the science says that. Like if, if everyone remembers what it was like a little over a year ago when they said 40,000 people could die in this pandemic. And some estimates rage up to 250,000. And people said, oh, it'll never be that bad. And now it's over 500,000, right? And, and that same kind of scientific analysis tells us that the sea levels are gonna rise. And, and it's just a question, is it gonna be one meter or three meters or five meters? And, and any of those scenarios are really, really bad. And so that's the first one. And then the second one is wealth inequality. We have this tiny segment of people who are getting richer and richer at an unimaginable rate. And again, money is one thing, but you think of the power that gives them. And then 
all the rest of the people have uh, you know, just a little uh, portion of what's left over. So it's a super big problem. And that means that the powerful people keep running things and they're running them into the ground and they're fools and they're, and they're selfish and they're blind. Um, and then the third one, the third problem is weapons that uh, we just keep making more weapons and we think we're gonna be safer with more weapons. But when you have those first two problems, uh, destabilizing the world, the environment and economic inequality, and then you have weapons, we're in a lot of trouble. So that's, so what I would say is, I don't know how this is gonna turn out. Uh, I, and I have my doubts that we human beings are going to be able to change uh, quick enough to avoid some pretty rough times. But what that does to me is it doesn't make me give up. In fact, it makes me feel if I were to give up, I would be so disgusted with myself. I, 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 you know, the worse this looks to me, the more dedicated I am to try to raise my voice and do what I can to pr provide an alternative. And, um, and that's what I think is the right thing to do uh, for, for, for everyone who can. I mean, if people are overwhelmed by despair, I certainly don't criticize them, I understand. But for those of us who can keep, uh, keep up the struggle, that's what I think we should do, whether or not there are hopeful signs. And look, I know, you know uh, uh, people want to be optimistic and hopeful and I'm all for that. Uh, but um, but uh, I, I, I'm also suspicious of hope. <laughs> I'm suspicious hmm. of it, yeah. So what does the lived experience of faith look like when you're convinced by the sorts of things that you just rattled off there? That there's that, that there's only a fool's hope, or that um, that you, you just can't bring yourself to believe that things are actually going to achieve the kind of promised land final ending where we all want. What what does an experience of faith feel like at that point? Well, you know, there's a I guess she identifies as a Buddhist um, environmental brilliant human being named Joanna Macy, and I, I think she speaks the truth. She says, if anybody tells you that everything is going to be okay they're lying, they don't know. And if anybody tells you that there's no hope and that everything's going down the toilet, uh, don't believe them. They have no way of knowing that. And, and so I think what that says to us is, I don't think we act based on what the odds are. I think we act based on what is the best and right thing that we can do. Um, and to me, that maybe is a deeper kind of hope than a hope based on, uh, you know, to quote, uh, Hunger Games, that the odds are ever in our favor. Um, uh, and to me, maybe that's what faith is at its deepest. I, I love that phrase. It's in the New Testament in Romans 4. It says, in hope against hope, Abraham believed. And uh, I, that phrase, in hope against hope, like all hope was gone, but he decided to hope anyway. Um, uh, that to me is when we get down to what faith maybe really is, that we say, I'm going to do the right thing. Uh, uh, because not because I think it's going to work or it's going to pay off. I think that's who I want to be, <laughs> the kind of person who does that. So yeah. let me, can I ask my follow-up question then, Brian? Yeah. Uh, int introduce a little bit of, you know, hope into the, the situation. I, you know, you, you described this conversation of marching with this, your friend named Hannah. Yes. And yes. she is this remarkable person who um, is given herself to being an advocate for the earth and for all sorts of things. And she said, I don't think it's going to actually do anything, but I just love it too dang much to give up, which is just yeah. this beautiful picture. But at the same time, I'm a couple of things. One is I'm an, I consider myself an unabashed progressive Christian. Yes. It means I believe that like things are getting progressively better. There's something yes. out there that we, we're, we need to move towards yes. rather than going back. And also, I live in light of the kingdom of God and new creation that I think was this inaugurated eschatology in the resurrection yes. that we're moving towards. And I think you could even look his historically and say there's less war than there's ever been right now. Yes. It's better for women than it's ever been now. It's better for uh, marginalized communities than it's ever been now, even though it's terrible in, in yes. many ways. Right. Yes. But I, I, I still live with this eschatological hope that we are headed towards something somewhere good where Jesus says, I'm making all things new. Yes. How do you square that with the despair in the, you know, I've got these three things and then also mm -hmm. new creation. Yes. Well, f first, I'm so glad you raised that because I 100% I agree with you. Everything you said is true um, by almost every indicator. 
you know, we really are making progress. I think we're in a really dangerous moment right now. Um, you know, progress that we've made on race could be just swept away in, uh, you know, in one election. Um, and so we, um, uh, you know, things are always fragile with us human beings. Uh, it's, it's uh, I think about my friends who are recovering from alcoholism or some other form of addiction. And, you know, you meet them and they say, yeah, you know, I'm six months sober, I'm six years sober, I'm 26 years sober. But they, in saying it that way, they're always remembering, I could go out on a bender tonight and I could be in trouble again tomorrow. So it's this sense that, you know, we human beings are, are, are uh, we're, we're prone to, to uh, wander as the old hymn says. So, um, so here's the way that, it, that feels honest to me. It's not to say, I'm going to have my realized eschatology and my eschatological hope so that that uh, removes my sense of danger and warning. And uh, uh, I'm not gonna choose one over the other, but I'm not gonna choose my danger and warning and make that erase my hope. I'm gonna hold both mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm gonna live with that tension. Now that's something that a stage one, in stage one, we can't do. We have to say it's either hope or despair because we're in that dualistic stage. Starting in stage two, we, we start to see oh, it might be necessary to hold both of those. And um, I think probably in stage three, we're probably lean more toward despair, right? But maybe in stage four, we learn how to hold them both together. Um, and uh, I, I also think there's another dimension of this that happens as, as we mature, partly getting older, partly maybe getting wiser, is we also start to learn that my circumstance is very localized. Mm -hmm. um, it's localized in time and it's localized in space. So that, for example, while the great awakenings were going on that Christians, that white Christians love to celebrate, you know, those days when people were going to Methodist revivals or Pentecostal revivals and people were being slain in the spirit and raising their hands and feeling the presence of the Holy Ghost, there were other people being whipped and across town there was a child being molested. And so those things exist simultaneously. And, and I think we have to try to hold the agony of both of them together. Yeah. That's really good. Sounds like harmony. Yeah, and and it it's and it sounds like the Bible too. You know, the the Bible has both the the, the Bible has. In fact, the, it's what the prophets do. They hold out warning and they hold out hope. Yes, and they don't back off on the warning and they don't back off on the hope. They hold them both out and and constantly face us with with both. I love it. Yeah, speaking of the character Hannah in your book that Randy mentioned yeah. earlier. Um, so in describing what might be left after even hope is gone, certainly after certainty is gone, but even after hope is gone, there's a really beautiful, and I found it kind of moving section or paragraph towards the end of your book. Would it be okay if I read a portion of your book back to you I love <laughs> to, it. I'd love to get it. more thoughts on it? Uh, so in describing what might be left after that, you just call it aliveness. And I really love that. So, so here's what you say. This is page 190. I often grieve the losses that have come through the stages of faith. But other times it dawns on me that what I have left are the best things. And even though I'm not always sure if I'm miserable or ecstatic, I know I'm alive. I know you've already experienced that aliveness. It may have been for a fleeting moment at the birth of a child, the death of a parent, an experience of profound sexual intimacy, a sublime turn in a symphony or poem or film, or an act of self-giving. It may have come as you looked out the window of a train or airplane, as you walked along a hiking trail when you body surfed a curling wave at the beach, or as you held or nursed your newborn child. You may have hardly even acknowledged that little moment because it was so foreign and odd on the one hand, or so personal and intimate on the other. It may have even scared you a little bit, or embarrassed you, even made you feel guilty because it didn't fit in the small boxes of simplicity, complexity, or even perplexity. But whenever it came and however it felt, you knew you were alive, and you knew life was precious, holy, sacred. You knew more than you could put into words. You felt in your marrow that every single thing was priceless and profound and beloved. Mm. That's beautiful. First of all, Thanks. it reminds me a bit of something C.S. Lewis said. I think it was in the problem of pain about a secret thread that runs yes. through all our experience that to him spoke of joy in heaven, but that you can't really communicate to someone else. You just yeah. call it being alive. Yeah. 
what do you have in mind there and how does it relate to faith? Can you say more about that? Well, I got to tell you, as you read that, I, I feel a little bit emotional because um, we're, we're having this conversation on a Thursday night and on Sunday afternoon, I saw the, the woman, her, her name isn't, you know, she has, I change people's names, uh, but who's kind of the basis of that story. Uh, I live just down the road from uh, a town called Immokalee, which is kind of the center of migrant farm worker uh, life in uh, east of the Mississippi. And so the farm workers start down here in the winter, they pick tomatoes and uh, then they move up with the crops. Uh, and by October, they'll be picking apples up in Michigan and then they'll come back down to Florida here. And um, they have a rough life and they're treated terribly and the food industry is such a mess. And so I've been involved with the Immokalee community and it's one of the, it's a beautiful blessing in my life. But one of the farm workers, a few, right after George Floyd, shortly after George Floyd was killed by a police officer putting his knee on his neck for about eight minutes. Uh, a man in Immokalee was killed. He was having a mental uh, uh, breakdown. Um, in fact, it was religious related. He told his 12 year old son that he was seeing angels and demons, uh, interestingly, based on our, uh, that story earlier. And uh, he was having a mental breakdown. And so in the middle of the night, he'd left the house and he had a shovel and I guess he was banging the shovel on someone's house. And obviously she, the woman inside was scared. She called the police, the police came. In 13 seconds, they shot him. Mm -hmm. they, from the time they got out of their car till he was dead, dying in the street, 13 seconds. Uh, and uh, so it's one of these tragic stories of, of a police officer making a mistake. And then the sheriff's office said, everything's fine. There's, you know, there's no need for any change. He, he acted according to plan. And so what happened is the people, the farm workers in this community said, we're gonna have a vigil for, uh, for this fellow. And, uh, and uh, so I, I was there and I saw her across, uh, across the crowd. And it's just, as you were reading that paragraph, I just thought of how we felt at that vigil. And I, I was asked to get up and say something as a former clergy person. And so all I said is I, I said to the 200 people around, and of course, probably 20% of us spoke English and 80% spoke Spanish. So everything I said was translated. But I said, could we just stop and could everyone look around at the faces of the other people here? And do you realize that all of us are here because of love? Um, because we love this man who was killed and because we love this town and because we love life and we don't want our children to have happened to them what happened to this man and, and we love the police and we want them to learn how to do better. And, um, and we just looked around the, 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 the uh, we were out on a street corner and I think we just felt that love. And in that moment, here's the thing, you could stay home and, and read about, uh, you know, read about this dear man being killed by the police and you could be angry and you could be cynical and you could be ticked off and, and all the rest. But I can guarantee if you showed up on that street corner, you would have felt love and you would have felt that aliveness and you would have felt like, you know, God might not seem real when you're sitting at home reading about this or seeing it on TV. But mm -hmm. when you're here with 200 people who care, there is something real there. And that's, yeah. Uh, so as you read that, that's, that's so, mm -hmm. so relevant to what just happened the other day. Well, Brian, um, got one more, one more question that I'd love to hear you in your pastoral, really wonderful way air out for our listeners a little bit. But there's this thread that weaves through the book that I love where you just keep on hitting this, this, this drum that is the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. And you talk about how in the first two stages, maybe you have your, your Christianity or your religion as a set of beliefs, but that the goal is to move that to a, a faith journey. And you say, basically quoting the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, that the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. Can you just give us your, however many minutes you want to take, mm. just just go riff on that a little bit? Well, first of all, if, if Paul had not said that, and I was the one who said it, that if I were to say neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, and then I might say, 
neither adult baptism nor infant baptism. In fact, neither baptism or non-baptism. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, creeds, in fact, church buildings, in fact, clergy, in fact, <laughs> the Bible. whether you take the Eucharist or not, whether you believe the Bible's an errand or a bunch of myths, it doesn't mean anything at all. If, if I were to say that, a whole lot of people would be really, really ticked off at me. And, yes, uh, sir. Uh, but the fact is, that is what Paul said. Um, he took the boundary marker of his religious community, which was circumcision. And remember, there's no place in the Bible, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, where God said, listen, I'm giving you this thing for, called circumcision. I just want you to observe it for about 800 years. Then it won't be important after, after that, or, or 1,200 or 2,000 or however many years. It was like, this is the way it is forever. And then Paul comes along and says, that's not that, it's not, it's not that, in fact, it's not important at all. What really matters is faith expressing itself in love. And, and then once you see that, and then you go back and you read the gospels, you realize that's what Jesus was saying. And, uh, you know, when he, when he says in the Sermon on the Mount, I have not come to abolish the law uh, and the prophets, but to fulfill it. Um, what, what could he mean? Well, he's saying, look, I'm not throwing them away. They took you as far as they can. I want to take you to the next stage, if we could say it that way. Mm -hmm. And when I think of it that way, and I look over the whole Bible, and you know, I was a preacher like, like you, so I, I spent an awful lot of my life in the Bible. And you know, I would preach two or three times a week, and I'd be leading Bible studies, and I was writing books. Man, I'm a Bible guy, right? And here's what I can tell you. Um, early in the Bible, we have uh, uh, law. And law is what really matters. In fact, before law, you know what we have? We have patriarchs. Mm -hmm. um, and patriarchs, they, they have the patriarchs with no law. We might say that's sort of an authoritarian system, a, a patriarchal system. Then they get law. And law is a big step forward. But you know what? Law isn't enough. And, and you know, the Hebrew scriptures say the law comes from God. It's a gift from God. But it wasn't the last gift. And then a new gift comes. And you've got the wisdom literature. You've got Proverbs that says, here's all these other things. These aren't exactly laws, but they'll help you to get through life. And, and, and then you get to the prophets. And the prophets have the nerve to say that God doesn't really even care about all those laws. <laughs> that what God cares about is doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with God. I mean, what an incredible thing. So you start with patriarchs and then you go to law and then you go to wisdom and then you go to justice. And then Jesus comes along and says, the greatest command is love. So it seems to me, if we look at it this way, that the entire process is supposed to lead us to love, but because of the way we read the Bible and because of our love affair with authoritarianism, we have done a great job of stopping at, at authority figures or stopping at law or stopping even at wisdom or stopping at justice, although not enough of us even get as far as justice. And it seems to me if we go all the way to love, we'll get law and we'll, we'll get authority, the right kind of authority and the right kind of law and the right kind of wisdom and the right kind of justice. Because in the context of love, it just, yeah, it, it all fits together. In fact, it's something else Paul wrote. He said, um, over all of the qualities that you seek for in life, he says, put on love, which holds everything together in perfect harmony. And that I, is really one of the places where that word harmony came for, for me. Love is what brings everything together in perfect harmony. Mm, so good. The book is Faith After Doubt, Why Your Belief Stopped Working and What to Do About It by Brian McLaren. You can find it everywhere you find books. Um, Brian, I'm wondering um, if you could finish our time. I know people are listening who are struggling with doubt and feeling inadequate, maybe even feeling like they got to hide. Um, yeah. they're, they're just experiencing the whole thing. I have doubts. We all have doubts. Could you just, we don't do this all the time, but I, I, I would love for you to just speak a blessing over us in our doubt and in our faith journey. Is that okay? Uh, I'd be, be honored to do that. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is if you're a parent, um, I want you to ask yourself if you would ever want your children to be afraid to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. um, if you'd ever want your children to think that if they tell you the truth, you're going to torture them or beat them or hate them. 
imagine if your child is terrified and he's afraid to tell you he's terrified. And so he tries to pretend he's brave, but it's killing him inside. And would you like your child to have to suffer with that? Um, and I, I know that every one of us who's a parent, we wouldn't want our children to suffer. We, we love our children too much. We, we would want the truth from them. We want them to feel free. They could confide anything to us. And I suppose the blessing I would wish on everyone is that you would have the courage and the guts and the anger and the fury <laughs> to believe that anyone who tells you uh, that God will beat you up for being honest, that those, that those people are wrong, and that you have the courage to believe that God is at least as kind a person as you are. <laughs> and I would hope that you wouldn't just believe that about God, but that you would be willing to at least surrender some part of your own brain to agree with God in that, so that some part of you would stop condemning you for being honest. Uh, there's that beautiful Psalm where David finally admits that he's been lying about some wrong, terrible wrongs that he's done. And then he says, um, you don't even desire all those offerings that, you know, we were, that Moses told us we had to make. It's one of those places where there's actually an argument in the Bible. Uh, you don't really, what you desire is truth in the innermost being. Mm -hmm. And so the thing I would want to bless, say as a blessing to everyone would be, may you seek truth in your innermost being. Um, I, I, I would say it like this, whoever God is, whatever God is, I think God would rather you say, I don't think I believe in you than to say, I don't believe in you, but I'm going to pretend I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and that honesty gives us something to work with. And truth in the innermost being is, is something to aspire to. And, and I think what we find is when we bring out the, the deep secret, the thing we're afraid of, uh, we, we actually find that, that the fear leaves that thing for us. And, and we find peace and we find grace and we find acceptance. So that would be my prayer and my blessing for people. And, uh, and maybe I'd say one other thing. Um, uh, there is a perverse part of our brains that likes to beat ourselves up. And that perverse part of us looks for people who will beat us up. Um, but there's another part of us that wants to be a friend to ourselves. And, and that part of us looks for people who treat us and see us with grace. And, and I'd like to ask people to dare to believe that that is the part of that's within each of us that is the best reflection of what we mean when we say the word God. Beautiful. Brian McLaren, you're a gift to us, you're a gift to this world. Thank you so much for joining us. What well, can I say? Thanks for the podcast. Thanks for the good work you're doing. You know, it, I'll just say one place where people are safe to think about their doubts is while they're in their car driving along, listening to a podcast like this and people like you are creating space for open discussion. So God bless you. Keep up the great work. Thanks so much. Thanks. Man, Brian, I could keep going all night. Oh man. <laughs> Well, what, hey, I wanted to tell you guys, those are great questions. Man, I love those questions. So thank you. We tend to overdo it on the questions a little bit. We try to edit ourselves, but it doesn't work. <laughs> I think, that, keep it up. I think those are just great. I think you got exactly the right instincts. So fun. And, and we didn't ask like, you, uh, we, we usually ask our guests if they're drinking anything. This is part of, part of, the, uh, part of our shtick, but we forgot to do that. Well, um, I'd be embarrassed uh, to, to tell folks that I, in my refrigerator, the only alcohol I have is Bud Light Lime. I think that's a little <laughs> windy, so that's all I got. Well, that'll be an outtake. That'll be an outtake.